Coming up next, we're gonna go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1966. A hell by many is the finest year in music history. Hard to believe it was 55 years ago. Um, we're gonna re-rank these songs based on how many times they've been streamed and viewed since, including your memories and also artist commentary. This one has quite a few exclusive interview clips with legends, actual legends. It was the year uh, of the Beatles and the Beach Boys trying to top each other for new musical heights along with the Monkees. There was Motown. This chart features a song that is voted as the greatest single ever over and over again. The stories are coming up. You're going to love it next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. You know, to be a part of our, our music history daily. We get it straight from the artists, the stories of the songs. And if you like, uh, check out our exclusive content on Patreon by clicking on the link in the description. You can also see our new merch. It's all below, Vintage Years Collection, Professor of Rock, everything. So it's time for another edition of our show, The Hit Song Redux, where we travel back to a week in the golden era of rock and roll, and we re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on their legacy since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100 with your stories, your dedications, and we also have artist commentary. I mean, this program is a tip of the hat to my hero, Casey Kasem. And this time we travel back to the end of this week in November of 1966. Somewhere in this countdown is what uh, many consider to be the greatest song ever. And we've got some legends telling the stories here. This is a really good one. And we've also got another twist this week. So stick with us as I, I think you'll dig this little shakeup, make you think a little bit. Before we go into this top 10, you know, to get us in the mood here, uh, let's talk about the top movies of the box office. Uh, this week it was Dr. Zhivago. Is Dr. Zhivago. Winner of six Academy Awards. Uh, the Lee Marvin, uh, Burt Lancaster Western, The Professionals. And the Julie Andrews movie, Hawaii. The top TV shows were The Andy Griffith Show. Green Acres. Gomer Pyle. Gomer Pyle, USMC. And the Beverly Hillbillies. The Beverly Hillbillies. Wow, that takes you back. So let's get into it. Coming in at number 10, uh, this is a song I'd forgotten about, but I remembered it instantly from hearing it on Oldies Radio when I was growing up when I revisited it. Let's see if you remember it. It's I'm Your Puppet by James and Bobby Purify. Now, the song was actually written by Dan Penn and Spooner Oldham. Uh, it was nominated for a Grammy Award in 67 for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or a Group with Vocals. Got full of your now, James and Bobby Purify were an R&B singing duo that originally comprised cousins James Purify and Robert Lee Dickey. This is one of those long lost hits of the 60s uh, that, again, you've kind of forgot about, but it's actually garnered about 48 million streams since then. Pretty amazing. At number nine, we have an all-time rock and roll classic from a man who's inspired everybody from Bruce Springsteen to John Mellencamp. It's uh, Devil with a Blue Dress on, Good Golly Miss Molly from the great Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. This was originally recorded by Shorty Long in 1964 as Devil with the Blue Dress. Long wrote the song with Motown producer Mickey Stevenson. Long's version was uh, kind of bluesy and didn't have the, the typical Motown sound, but it didn't chart. And then two years later, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels uh, they recorded the song as a medley with an original arrangement of uh, Little Richard's uh, Good Golly Miss Molly. Miss Molly. Miss Molly. Miss Molly. 
It was much faster than Shorty Long's version. Here's what Mitch Ryder said about the song in an interview that I did with him. We scorched the earth with oh, that one. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> what inspired but there's that? Drums, I, I, man. There's his foot for an entire three minutes. You know, I'm going, what the f Johnny? Are you doing speed? No, that was him. That was his adrenaline. Well, that energy on that recording. That short transition, you talk about Jim McCarty when you're going into Gagali Miss Molly when he plays on guitar. He's doing the modulation there, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Incredible. And well, then, look at that skill. I mean, he, like I said earlier, he studied jazz. So it was no trick for him to modulate a song at that tempo. You know, he just knew instinctively how to. He, he didn't even move his hand really on the neck. He stayed in the same phrasing and managed to go into another octave. I'm still trying to figure out how he did that. So this song peaked at number six, and it's a song that you really need to rediscover. It's been streamed about six million times since. We need to up those streams. It's a great song. Coming at number eight, we have a song that is very special to me. I actually sang this to my wife at our wedding. It was a, a big departure for this artist who was normally a rock and roll big band crooner. It's a great Bobby Darren with If I Were a Carpenter. If I were a carpenter And you were a Beautiful folk song written by Tim Harden. Uh, it was recorded by various artists, including Bobby. It's also the Four Tops. I were a carpenter And you were a lady And Johnny Cash. If I were a carpenter And you were a lady the song is rumored to have been inspired by Tim Harden's love for actress Susan Morse. Uh, this is while he was uh, constructing his recording studio, apparently. Hence, uh, if I were a carpenter. Would you marry me anyway? Would you have... This was a big song for Bobby Darren, as he hadn't had a hit in three years. It's actually a funny story here. So... Music publishers Charles Koppelman and Don Rubin got with Bobby Darren to show him a song that they felt was perfect for him. It was Do You Believe in Magic? Only Bobby Darren didn't think it was a hit record. He said, you know, guys, it's very cute, but it'll never be a hit. Of course, the song became a top 10 hit for Love and Spoonful. Do you believe in magic in a young girl's heart? Later, they went back to Bobby again a second time with a song called Summer in the City. Summer in the city, back of my neck getting dirt and gritty. Again, Bobby turned it down flat out. This time it was a number one hit for Love and Spoonful, and it sold over 2.5 million copies. Now, when they called Bobby Darren a third time, before they even sat down, he said, I don't care what you got, I'm going to record it. And he did. They showed up with uh, If I Were a Carpenter, and it was Bobby Darren's last big hit before he sadly passed away in his late 30s. If I were a carpenter. I love how this song was used years later in an episode of Wonder Years. Okay, in at number seven, we have one of the most covered songs ever. It was actually a number one hit twice for two different artists. And that wasn't even its best version, in my opinion. It's from the songwriting team of Holland Dozier Holland. It's The Supremes with you. Keep me hanging on. You just keep me. They took it to number one. Kim Wilde uh, also did the same in 1987. Holland Dozier Holland actually set out to write a rock song for the Supremes, and this is what they came up with. But you keep me hanging on. So I've interviewed a lot of people who were part of this song. Uh, legendary Vanilla Fudge drummer Carmine Apice. Fudge's version went to number six, my favorite version. Also, Mary Wilson of the Supremes and writer-producer Lamont Dozier. Here's what they all said about it. Totally, we were totally into the music that we were re recording now. You know, unlike in the very early days when, you know, we had to accept whatever the guys would bring us. That was basically the, once we got the sound and the feeling, um, and the guitars that we wanted. Uh, and I saw Walter Winchell on TV doing that Morris, did, 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 like that old telegraph. Thing. 
Good morning, Mr. America. And I said, now I'm sitting there just watching TV, looking, and, and he kept doing it. And I looked, and all of a sudden I heard the guitars in my, in my mind, you know. Carmine, I wanted to ask you about You Keep Me Hanging On. We tried to match the lyrics to the mood of the, of the music, you know. The lyrics were really hurting lyrics. So they said, man, we should slow this down and really put some emotion in it. And that's what we ended up doing. I remember the first couple of times we played it in a club when we, you know, we play other songs that people would like dance. But when we played that song, everyone would come up to the front of the stage and watch us. You know, and that, so that gave us an idea that this song was something special. Our viewers absolutely love this. Uh, Kelly McRio said every single time for her entire life, when something happens that's out of control, she would always sing, and there ain't nothing I can do about it. Sometimes with the, you know, with the background vocal, sometimes without, but always just like Diana Ross. And there ain't nothing I can do about it. Viewer screen name RBS told a really cool story that actually he should share in detail below. He was introduced to the sounds of Motown, uh, which began his love of record collecting. He wants to dedicate this song to his wonderful grandma. I actually call her Granny. Let me be, set me free. The hit song Redux is sponsored by Zenny Eyewear, my favorite glasses. You got to check out the latest styles at Zenny.com. Zenny rocks, especially their blue blocks. Been a game changer for me. So coming in at number six, one of the 60s most famous novelty hits. It's the new vaudeville band with Winchester Cathedral. This one went to number one. The new vaudeville band was actually uh, the creation of the British songwriter and record producer Jeff Stevens, who arranged this to sound like Rudy Valley's uh, vaudeville hits in the 1930s. I knew the moment that I met you, I was... He actually performed it through a megaphone to create that sound. Winchester Cathedral, you're bringing me... Now, for those of you who don't know, the Cathedral Church of the Holy Trinity, commonly known as uh, Winchester Cathedral, is the cathedral of the city of Winchester, England, it is among the largest of its kind in Northern Europe. The song has been played uh, about five million times since its release. Okay, so we're halfway through the countdown, and I gotta tell you, three of the next five hits, some of the greatest songs ever, with commentary straight from the artist. So stick with us all the way to number one. Coming in at number five, a song by a band that for a time actually sold more records than the Beatles. Led by 60s teen heartthrob Peter Noon, it's Herman's Hermits with the song Dandy. Dandy, Dandy, where you gonna go now? Actually, Ray Davies of the Kinks wrote this song and originally the, the Kinks recorded it. Dandy, Dandy. We're gonna go now. I had a chance to discuss this song at length with Peter Noon. Here's what he said about it. When you think about it, we were pretty, it's kind of punkish really. We didn't really have a plan other than we thought this was a good idea. To, in order to be in the game and get paid for it, you had to be unique. You always will be free and you need no sympathy. So, Every band was different. You know, there were loads of bands who were the same, they were, but the ones who made it were all different. The Stones weren't like the Beatles, no. and the Beatles weren't like the Who or the Kinks or the Honeycombs. Everyone was kind of unique. And I think we chose a good one, which was to be very English. You're all right. You're all right. I'm really excited to announce the number four spot. It's been named the greatest single ever in numerous best of lists written by one of the last musical geniuses living on this planet. It's the Beach Boys with their pocket symphony, Good Vibrations. I, I love the colorful clothes you wear. You know, we're gonna be covering this song in depth in a separate video very soon. However, 
Here's what musical genius and my hero, Brian Wilson, said about it. Well, Good Vibrations was inspired by Mike. I played, you know, bom, boom, bom, 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 bom. He goes, hey, well, what if we said, I'm picking up Good Vibrations. We were on our way to writing the song. I'm picking up Good Vibrations. She's giving me the exercise. Yeah. And the Thurman that you use in there, what brought about that? That was my brother Carl's idea. He wanted yeah. to. He said, why don't we use a theremin, a real spooky theremin? I said, sure. And the cellos, using it as a rhythm right. section. Good Vibrations, of course, went to number one, and Brian would call it the summation of his musical vision. It is a harmonic convergence of imagination and talent, to production values, and craft, songwriting, and spirituality. This song has had 350 million streams since its release. And you know what? You guys love this song as much as I do. Our viewer Rob Clark said, and I quote, my dad introduced me to the Beach Boys when I was about 10. He did so with the song Good Vibrations on a cassette he had in his truck going to visit my granddad. I hear it now and I think of both of them and I still can't help singing along with the song. Well, Rob, let's dedicate this number one hit to your father and your grandfather. Viewer Jay Thomas said that his first concert was at the age of four and he was sitting on the shoulders of his father watching the Beach Boys at Ocean City, Maryland. Very cool. Viewer James said that he was born in 1965 and grew up in sunny Southern California. The song reminds him of being in the backseat of his parents' car with the wind blowing through his hair, with the smell of the ocean air, and he knew his life was blessed. Alina Mordashiva, I hope I said that right, uh, from Bulgaria, says that she and her sister had good vibrations on their clock alert ring. And now every time she hears it, she returns to this strange feeling of transitional condition between dream and awakened reality. That's very cool. Okay, at number three, we have a very cool group indeed. It's by a band that was called Question Mark and the Mysterians with the song 96 Tears, a true classic. This song was written by the front man who wanted to remain anonymous, hence the question mark. He is listed on the composer credits uh, as Rudy Martinez, as we know now. At one point, he referred to the individual band members only by three-letter names. I mean, at one point, the band was known as XYZ. The mystery helped uh, market that group, though, who uh, wore dark glasses to you know, add to that intrigue. Now, there was rumor that the song was originally called uh, 69 Tears, I believe it was, or Too Many Teardrops. That was sometimes reported. But the band says it's definitely not accurate. Frontman Rudy Martinez has said that the number 96 has a deep philosophical meaning to him. So far has refused to elaborate too much on it. Our viewers love this song as well. You're gonna cry. Viewer Karen Nair said, and I quote, when I was in high school in the 1960s in San Jose, California, the Wink Soft Drink Company sponsored a contest that whichever school amassed the most Wink bottle cams would win a question mark on the Mysterians free concert right on campus, Lehigh. They won, or she said we won. Unfortunately, we only got some Mysterians. There was no question mark. Interesting. I want to send a shout out to our viewer, Tommy Amoeba. That's his screen name. The song is dedicated to you, man. I loved your story. Very cool. You're gonna try, 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 try. That is big deal. So this song has almost 40 million streams since its release. It's so a coming in at number two. It's the band that exploded at this point in the 60s. This was the beginning. They had a TV show that many legends actually tried out for. It's the Monkees, with a song that many don't realize is a protest song. It's the last train to Clarksville. Last train to Clarksville and I'll meet you at the station. Written by the hit songwriting team of Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart, who uh, wrote many of the Monkees' hits. The lyrics tell the story of a man phoning the woman he loves, urging her to meet him at a train station in Clarksville before he leaves for a very long time. Cause I'm leaving 
And I'll actually let songwriter Bobby Hart tell you the rest of the story. Our little two cents to the growing unrest with the Vietnam War. And it was just heating up at that point and the riots were starting and there was a whole there was a whole cultural revolution going on that just at that point. So we just made a song about a fella going off to war not knowing if he'd ever come back and wanting one last night with his sweetheart. This is actually the Monkees' first single. It was released shortly after their TV show started. Our viewers had a few things to say about this smash hit. Uh, viewer Jane M said, and I quote, I was first introduced to the Monkees when I was 11 years old. My friends and I were big fans. We watched their TV show, uh, we bought their records, and cut out their pictures from magazines like Tiger Beat and 16. The last Train to Clarksville was one of the first 45s I ever owned, and I drove my family nuts playing it over and over. Uh, we would often sing it at the back of a bus when we were going to school. I was thrilled many years later when I saw Mickey Dolenz in concert, and the highlight was when he played this iconic song. The last train to Clarksville, be waiting at the station. It's very cool. I, I remember watching the Monkees TV show on Nick at Night. I watched it all the time. Viewer Shelly Smith shared that the last train to Clarksville was on a well-used mixtape for an aerobics workout class she had in high school. Whenever she hears it, she can distinctly recall the leg lift moves every single time. <laughs> it's funny how music does that with us. Okay, here we are at the number one song, Drum Roll Please. This song was a change in direction for an artist who had a lot of hits that were cover songs. Well, this is one he wrote with the great Lou Adler. It's Johnny Rivers with Poor Side of Town. To the poor side of town. Here's what Johnny told me about this number one hit. Well, it was a song I'd been working on for a while, and it's really odd because at the time I was writing it, I was, wasn't on the poor side of town. I was living in Beverly Hills. <laughs> so yeah. a gal leaves a guy and goes off with a wealthy dude, you know, only to find out that he's just a jerk. That rich guy you've been seeing. Goes back to the guy that was her longtime boyfriend and who she really loved, and, and he takes her back. So welcome back, baby. It was a song basically about forgiveness. And yeah, it, it, uh, it was a good song. We can make it, baby, from the post side of town. Okay, and now for the twist. So what's interesting about uh, these top 10 charts and how the songs perform years, even decades later, is that some of these songs that were massive hits in their day they don't have the long-term relevance, you know, like some of the songs that didn't even make the top 10. If you look at this countdown, the biggest band ever is missing during a time when one of their most revered albums was selling like hotcakes. I'm talking about the Beatles and Revolver. It was came out in August, but it was still selling. And yeah, some of the non-singles from Revolver might finish higher than some of the songs on this top 10 chart. So just for fun, for a little twist, I'm gonna take the highest streamed non-Beatles single from that album, and I'm gonna put it up against uh, all these songs. So let's see if it finishes in the top five or even the top 10. All right, here's a new top five based on all time views. Let's do it. At number five, The Monkees with Last Train to Clarksville with 42 million streams. At number four, I'm Your Puppa by James and Bobby Purify with 48 million streams. Coming at number three is You Keep Me Hanging On by The Supremes with 53 million streams. And at number two, it's the Beatles with their biggest non-single from Revolver, Here, There, and Everywhere. I want her everywhere, and if she's beside me. Paul McCartney's inspired love song that was actually, uh, he got it from listening to the Beach Boys uh, intro to California Girls. That's what inspired him to write it. He actually wrote it for his girlfriend at the time, Jane Asher. Isn't that amazing? I always wonder why the Beatles didn't release uh, more singles from Revolver or some of their other albums. To love her is to need her everywhere. I mean, it's had well over 60 million streams. And at number one, it's the Beach Boys with Good Vibrations with an amazing 350 million streams. I'm picking up good vibrations. So there it is, the new top five 
from November 1966 based on all-time streams, all-time views. How would you rank these top 10 songs? Let us know in the comments. And please share your memories of these songs on the amazing year 1966. What other weeks or years should we do uh, with this? When we do a Vintage Years collection for 66, who should we include? Now, if we didn't get to your dedication or memory, we will. Share with us in the comments. Uh, again, if you like our content, if you like this video, we'd love to have you subscribe, be a part of this community. Check out our Patreon, check out our Vintage Years collection, our merch below. All that does is help us keep the music alive. That is what we're here to do. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thank you.